This episode of the Renegade HPG podcast is sponsored by the Kickstarter campaign for the Redline Tactical Card Combat Game. Developed by Battletech fans as an homage to that long dormant CCG, Redline is an expandable card game featuring simultaneous combat and mission-based objectives. Deploy your army, then secure and hold territory to win. The Kickstarter is live now through September 4th. Visit Kickstarter now and search Redline to find out more and to support this exciting new entry into the wargaming field. Let's dive in. So, uh, everyone, welcome to uh, this awesome episode of the Renegade HPG podcast. Uh, my guests today are Terry Bohr and Peter Sunholm, the uh, first and second place at the original 1997 World Championships for the Battletech Trading Card Game. And uh, Terry, who uh, came back the following year to kind of avenge that loss uh, to Peter at the final table to, to win his own championship in 1998. Uh, but we're going to be kind of diving a little bit in, kind of following this uh, theme. The channel's been uh, exploring this, uh, this old classic game. And, uh, and we're gonna be talking a little bit about the old days and kind of the perspective uh, about the game from uh, when it originally launched and kind of that top competitive level. Um, so without, uh, without me talking too much and, and just kind of diving in, uh, uh, thanks uh, Peter and Terry for joining us for what is actually the second time, you know, big secret that uh, the first recording got completely deleted due to technical error. So these gentlemen have been very kind to, to sit down with me and uh, mostly pretend to have this awesome conversation all over wow. again for you guys, uh, but I'm sure we'll cover some new stuff we didn't cover the first time as well. But uh, but yeah, thanks guys, a double, uh, for kind of coming in and having this conversation uh, for take number two here. So, um, so to kind of kick off, uh, you know, my, my initial question, I want to kind of pick your brains just in terms of, um, you know, I certainly want to hear what the early days of the TCG were like, but I'm curious kind of what, what first brought you into the game? Were you guys uh, Battletech fans kind of leading up to the release of the trading card game? Did you have any exposure to it either through the tabletop or the video games? Or, or were you kind of like others where, you know, kind of caught up in that, that CCG boom of that, of that mid-90s and kind of found the game through that? Let's start with you, uh, Peter. Um. So I, I, I'm obviously, I live just uh, an hour down from Watsi land where the magic started um, with the magic trading card game. So I certainly played magic and magic was um, the gateway drug for me um, to get into it. However, um, the reason I specifically started playing Battletech was because um, since uh, back in 1990, um, my local group, uh, the Royal Olympic Guards, uh, we've been playing Battletech, the uh, actual mini game. Um, uh, um, as a matter of fact, in the mid '90s, I was actually um, uh, raided uh, by Mech Force North America, which was uh, the the competitive um, um, board game rating system. I was in the top ten in, in the in the Americas, and so we played the board game every Sunday with the group religiously. So it was just a natural jump for me uh, once the card game came out to actually start playing the card game, of course. Excellent, excellent. Terry, had you played it before? Or was that trading card game your first exposure? Uh, I had played Battletech as a kid in Car Wars, the Peter Jackson game, which is to me a lot like Battletech. You have cars instead of mechs, but it's the same idea. So I played that. I had played a little bit of some of the online Battletech occasional game of some sort of miniature. I came in though through Magic, similar to Peter. You know, I played Magic a lot, and I think my friend Yik, uh, Yikau, who's a prof now in um, in Canada, he he kind of introduced me to the game. That's what I remember, and I really liked it. I thought the game had a cool theme and good mechanics. Was a lot of fun to play. Uh, it was in many ways, I thought a better game than BattleTech. You know, the drawing the two cards meant that you, I feel like in Magic you just lose one every four or five games through a bad draw, and BattleTech mm -hmm. rarely had bad or much more rarely had bad draws. So I kind of you know enjoyed the game. We were already going to the uh, 1997 Gen Con, so we figured, eh, why don't we go and play in the world championship i don't think i can't remember if i had to qualify or not i think i do not, remember qualifying not in, not, not in the first one not in the first one okay the second one we had to qualify but not the first one okay so the second one i remember i think i qualified a couple places but um in 97 i think i just showed up and played Awesome. And what, what was that qualification like? Because I, I know even in these days for a lot of games, it's just kind of, you know, certainly for the smaller ones, it's just whoever can make it goes. But, uh, and even the qualification is kind of weird. What was, uh, and and for, for those listening, I mean, some people are listening, they weren't even born back then. So they don't understand that the, <laughs> that the internet and the kind of vast uh, organizational network wasn't the same back in, you know, 97 <laughs> that was that it is now. Um, so, you know, how did that, how did that local competitive scene work? You know, how do you guys kind of get tied into it? And what was that? 
that qualification process. I think I recall doing a qualif- qualifier in Montreal. My family's from Montreal, and I think we were there on a visit, and it coincided. I played uh, at some local shop, and I remember there being quite a few people there. This is a long time ago now, and yeah. yeah, it was fun to it was fun to play and see what something was like. I may also have played a qualifier, like a tournament in Toronto. My memory is a bit fuzzy, but I remember yeah qualifying through there, and I'm pretty sure I might have had a qualification from being second place the year before. So right, I think yeah. I kind of played more like a warm up just to see what it was like, and actually quite enjoyed the uh, the BattleTech tournaments. What was what was kind of that initial meta like for the game, and kind of what what was kind of popular, kind of on the local scene for you guys, you know, in terms of decks and, and strategies, and, and kind of how did that evolve through that first year as you kind of led into that that big championship? Peter, do you want to answer? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, I, I mean, we we pretty much had local meta games like yeah, there was Scry Magazine and a few different uh, you know entities that we like. There was not really any internet that you could you know scry and just look up decks per se. Mm-hmm. And like there was the Magic Dojo and a few things in the early days that had started for Magic, but certainly not for BattleTech. Um, I remember later on, I think it was year two or year three, they actually did list a few of the World Championship decks, but. But certainly there was no, no like, uh, Battletech uh, section for us to look up. So it was more we had our local meta games, and, and then it was like you heard through the rumor mill that, hey, there's like, the, for example, the Sandhurst deck was one that certainly blew up really fast because it, it was such an explosive deck that nobody could keep that under wraps. And so there were, like, some of those decks, um, you know, just through the grapevine you heard through the qualifier tournaments that there was, like, this deck. And so we had to build our own versions of it. But like there were all our own versions we didn't have like card for card what the deck looked like right right so there's still a lot of leeway for creativity there in that it's what, certainly yes yeah terry did you have do you have a similar experience or were you kind of you know dead set on kind of the same strategy that you ended up bringing to worlds that first year i was completely blind in the okay. first year we showed up I, my deck was not very good in the first worlds i think i was a pretty good player because i have had lots and lots of game experience and I, mm-hmm. I tend to be good at the more complex games but yeah my deck wasn't great and we just sort of came in and played and and that's where we came the second year was different we didn't really look at any meta we built all the decks ourselves we knew what the uh I probably built basically the top three or four decks that I saw out there. We knew them and we knew that our deck could beat all of them. There were, there was only the pilot deck that maybe we were a little afraid of and we tried to organize against that a little bit, but there they needed to get a good draw. And uh, so, but there was no, we had no outside resources whatsoever to um, that helped us, which is different than how magic has evolved around that time. Magic at that time was just starting to be people would could pull decks off the internet and play them. Mm-hmm. But prior to that, even for magic, when I was playing in the pro tour, we just built all our own decks. Um, and if you look at our results, like in some of the, or like pro tour Chicago, I think this would be 1997 maybe where the, the twin deck I was playing won the tournament, a guy named Paul McCabe, who was a friend of mine. I finished, I don't know, maybe I was top 32 or something. I took a bad turn somewhere in that tournament, but there was, it was all created. It wasn't really, we didn't get it off of anything. It was only later that people started to show up with these pre-made decks that were really excellent. So I think this was kind of pre uh, internet meta. And I thought yeah. that was good. That was a kind of a pure way to play the game and the way I liked it. Yeah. And that was kind of my, my next question was just, you know, you guys have been playing, you know, from before the internet kind of once it evolved, you know, do you, do you think that that, that access to that information has elevated the game um, in terms of just the competitive level and what it kind of, you know, almost kind of an arms escalation as it were in terms of the difficulty of the decks, or do you think it's kind of taken away too much in terms of that individual creativity, you know, with deck building and kind of the, the onus on the player to kind of build from scratch and come up with their own ideas? I think it's significantly worse to know exactly what to do. I think that um, takes away one of what I think was one of the most fun parts of um, magic and a huge element of skill. So like, for example, in magic, there was like this, um, meta tournament once a year where the top 16 players play and I, I played in that once and one of the guys I think the guy who actually won although I have to go look this up exactly he had people prep decks for him so they would say here's your deck for this special format here's your deck for this special format and I thought that kind of thing sort of ruined what was what was happening there were too many people who could just pick up a deck practice with it buy it and make it work and it cut down the skill level It increased the luck. And um, I think it kind of made the game a little bit less fun to see like five, six, seven identical decks all over the place, all yeah, tuned yeah. and all just taken off from, from the week before. So I, I, I didn't personally enjoy that. 
All right. Peter, do you have you know similar so, perspective? So no, I actually have a slightly different perspective. First of all, I think I think meta decking is inevitable. And I think it's inevitable because people want to, if you want to compete, you need to, you know, be the, have the best decks, I guess. And so you're clearly going to copy whatever the best deck is. Mm -hmm. So I actually think the onus is on the creators of the card games, whatever they are, to make sure that they create a diverse card game and a diverse meta game. I think that's extremely important. Like this last cycle of magic that we just went through, that went through a very, very restrictive meta game. And so I had, they had to start banning cards. And so I think they failed on creating a, a, a very, um, uh, you know, diverse metagame. Whereas if you look at uh, Legends of Runeterra, uh, created by um, uh, Riot Games, um, electronic ways, it has uh, probably like six different games that are in the, you know, in the top tier, uh, or decks that is. Um, so they have a very healthy metagame. And so I, I think it's based on the, uh, the you know, the, the card game itself, and, and the onus is on them. Um, I actually think it's good, and I think it's good, and the reason why is is that there's always going to be creative minds. Um, you know, uh, Terry's crew certainly was one of them in, in the Battletech era, I think. And um, uh, they're always going to come up with answers, whether there's a, you know, a posted deck or not. And what do you think, you know, in terms of kind of the, the responsibility of, of from the designer side and, and kind of the work that they need to do? Like, what are the elements that they need to be considering in order to ensure that happens? Is that simply a matter of really kind of designing the game out a couple of years into the future and making sure they're kind of staying ahead? Or is it just kind of a, a more consistency in terms of the elements and not introducing too much? You know, kind of what what kind of, you know, you know, hits that sweet spot in terms of designs that kind of avoid those pitfalls. See, I think there's two tiers to that. One of them is a level of arrogance that the actual creators have, that they think that they know better than the actual community. Mm -hmm. And and we had in 98, I, we discussed it in the first recording, but in, in 98, we had a, a community tournament where up here in, in Watsi land, mm -hmm. the actual creators threw the gauntlet down because up here at the time, we had the top uh, uh, five of the top 10 rated players in the world. So we had a murderer's row of, of competitive players up up here in, in the in the community for the Battletech community. And so because of that, the creators threw down the gauntlet and said, we're going to have an event where the, we play the players in, a, in an exclusive event. And so then they invited the, the top 32 players from around here to come play them up at the Watsi Center. And, and they said, there will be no players in the top four. Uh, there will only be, you know, um, uh, creators. They were all boasting how they had all these hidden touchstone decks that we hadn't figured out. And of course, like we just discussed at the time, there were no posted decks and stuff. Yeah. And, and sure enough, had it not been for a, a shady pairing in the last round, because the pairings were supposed to be player versus a creator, uh, where they, in the final round, paired two creators against each other and managed to sneak one creator into the top four, it would have, in fact, been all players and no creators. But the final top four was three players and one creator, and we ousted him in the semifinals. So the players was uh, uh, myself versus uh, uh, my best friend uh, Dave Hymas in the finals. Uh, so no, there were no creators in the you know in the in the finals. Uh, passion, passion beats uh, job any day is what it been, I think it proves to be. Yeah, and and just and just raw numbers too. I mean, the, the community is you know exponential would be a would be a disservice to say how big the community is compared to the people that are designing it. So, um, but yet they felt that way though. Like they yeah. truly, truly felt that they had like us all beat that we had no understanding of how good their decks were. Mm -hmm. Do you think that uh, a sense of humility has crept into kind of modern game designers? You know, certainly magic is still going, you know, uh, strong in terms of community. Do you think they've kind of learned the lessons of the past or from other games? Or do you think that's still kind of a, a characteristic that you see um, in the people so, that are making the cards that you get to play? So the fact that they still keep on trying to create zero cost cards, which should never, ever, ever be created in a card game. No, I don't. Okay. <laughs> I mean, literally, they have never created a zero cost card that does not break the game in some way, shape, or fashion, and they still keep trying to do it. Interesting. Uh, like, they just have not learned their lesson. They're like, this time we're going to figure it out, and then they break yeah. the game again. It's like, no, you can't do it. Stop doing it.
Well, that's good. To, that's good to know because I had uh, I, thanks to, to to Michael Todd, who's a, a prolific kind of fan fiction producer and who I'd had a podcast on recently. He had he had he and his friends had come up with a template and he passed it on to me. So I've been having a blast, kind of making my own uh, TCG uh, BattleTech kind of custom cards and fan cards. And uh, and one of them was like a Wasp, which was a zero cost. Uh, so maybe I need to revisit that. You know, it'll break the game. <laughs> oh no, it'll break the game. And, uh, and I know somebody had mentioned that original that Sentinel, that zero cost, zero buyout Sentinel. Uh, that kind of emerged and people were trying to put 60 of those in a deck before that six six card got those uh you know did you did you guys encounter anything crazy like that you know or any kind of uh weird dynamics that popped onto the scene before before kind of the uh the limitations were placed on on cards like that i mean uh I played a lot of zero cost cards. This is for my world champion. <laughs> champion. But, uh, sorry, I mean I'm like filled with uh, filled with that. There's uh, the Cyrano, right? It was a zero cost, and um, if we get the right draw, we kill you in like four turns. It, yeah. It's incredibly fast, and there, we we put in so many of those different um, different cards, and that made a huge difference. So I, I can see that being uh, see that being problematic. Yes, zero cost, yeah. So so what's so what's the solution to that? Cause cards that like it's it's hard to justify one, and so they push them to two. Like what what's the fix for that? What can what can people or are these uh, as kind of fan designers like myself here making my own cards? What can what can I do to make sure I'm not you know creating a game breaking card with a zero cost? Just don't make a zero cost okay. card. <laughs> <laughs> right. So one minimum, one minimum, no buyouts. That, yes, correct. Okay. Yes. Okay. Don't try to cheat the system. I mean, that's the thing is they're trying to cheat the system, right? Mm. That's the whole point. Yeah, yeah. Gotcha. Um, now, I mean, you guys, you guys both have vast experience in terms of Magic the Gathering, as we've been talking about here, and uh, have both played at a, at a very high level for that. I I'm curious about your, your perspective in terms of the... Um, the comparison between the two games and kind of you know how how Battletech, uh, the trading card game, compared to Magic: The Gathering. You know, certainly they're both Richard Garfield games, and Battletech came later. So you know, we're assuming that he had a lot more experience. You know, when he was done designing Battletech, uh, I know a lot of people kind of really kind of love the fact that in Battletech everything on the board is is fair game. But I'm curious from you guys have as sir, have from having been at the very top of Battletech and have been very close to the top of Magic: The Gathering, of kind of what your what your uh, you know perceptions are into the relative um, you know strengths and weaknesses between both the games, and what really draws you to one game over the other. There we go. Ahead. So, I mean, I've played a lot of card games and a lot of different games, and I've played multiple games at at the very top level, not just BattleTech and uh, Magic. I think that Magic was able to strike kind of, in some sense, the perfect balance. They were able to have a game that was good enough for beginner players to have some chance and to enjoy it. It had enough art and theme. It had enough variety in the cards. Uh, the land system, it, you know, is very luck-based. Uh, so many games, even at the professional levels, come down to which cards you draw, how much land you get, and that um, has its pluses and minuses. You know, you could have a good enough deck without paying a ton of money, but if you paid a, a lot more, yes, you could have some extra pluses there. And that, I think all of the game was pretty fun to play. All of those things came together to build the biggest game. It just, they kind of, in some sense, got everything right enough. Okay. Um, Battletech, I think was, uh, I, in many ways, I preferred Battletech to Magic. Like I really enjoyed Battletech as a card game and the mechanics were really tight. It was very complex, but I don't think it was necessarily a great game for beginners because if I were to play a beginner, I would win 99 times out of 100. You know, I played a tournament where I drew only two resources the whole game, and I was still able to win by picking off people's cards, just kind of just barely hanging on, desperately hoping to draw a third resource in a card <laughs> where I had tons of resources in my deck and I'm drawing two cards a turn. And it just yeah. never happened. I was still able to kind of pull out that game. And it kind of speaks to the change of luck that is in those games, right? In the way that chess just... Um, great game in many ways but it's just not really very fun for a beginner and once mm -hmm. you get past a certain skill you always win or you always lose against certain opponents right it's hard to find that little range so i think that's what magic really um really did right another thing i thought BattleTech did right was the people by and large were friendly like you might play the game and you do like a little cheer before the round started and so on it wasn't as much business as the magic pro tour was uh, 
back then it was still pretty significant money and we were starting to see an emergence of like professional players. I'll put professional in quotes. They were, you know, a lot of them were living in their parents' basement and just not going to school and doing nothing with yeah. play magic. <laughs> but maybe professionals a little generous, yeah. but you get what I'm saying. Like they yeah. were really hardcore into the game and they played a lot and so on. So that started to get serious really, really fast right in the first year of the pro chart. I think Battletech never really was, um, was like that. And I think that was, uh, a strength of the game. But in the end, I don't know that Battletech really had enough replayability, that every set was different enough that mm -hmm. there was a reason to go back in and pick up those cards and do something new. Um, they just didn't quite have the player base, and I, I don't know that the cards quite had that mechanic. They would have had to make some pretty significant changes to future sets to make it really interesting and keep people coming back to play. Yeah. Peter, did you have a similar insight? Yeah, no, I, I absolutely agree with uh, Terry that I, I think it would have fallen to its own success in the end as far as like uh, uh, consistency. Um, what, what people complain about Magic the most is mana screw, right? And it's actually, I believe, the reason for why Magic is still so successful 30 years into the game is because of mana screw. It's actually the one ingenious part that Richard accidentally built into the game. Um, and I say accidentally because I don't think he actually wanted to build something so infuriating into the game. Yeah. But, but that's the reason for why, you know, uh, Bobby, five years old, can sit across from the world champion and actually beat him in a game. That will never happen in Battletech. Never. Mm -hmm. what, what Terry just described, where you can sit with two resources and actually beat somebody uh, that is less skilled than you in Battletech is, is because when you have two resources and two choices every turn, those choices, they will accumulate over the length of a game. And those, when, when you keep on making bad choices and a good player, experienced player, will keep on making the, the correct or the, the most optimal choices every turn, uh, those optimal choices will escalate the, the, your bad choices over the length of a game, which means that there will come a middle part of the game where suddenly your bad choices will catch up to you and the game will just end for you. And that doesn't exist in Magic to, to the same extent because there's always that luck part of the chance that, that Battletech has almost eliminated. It's not quite there because there's still some, you know, elements of luck in Battletech as well. Mm -hmm. but, but there's a whole lot less. That was actually part of what drew me into it because I, like Terry, am a, a very experienced gamer. I have played uh, a, a myriad of big different games at a very high level. I guess I'm, uh, we're both alpha, alpha competitors, I guess. Yeah. And, and the fact is, is that... Uh, that's why Battletech was, was so successful early on and why it drew players like myself and Terry, I believe, into the game. But also why it, the length of its success, I don't think, like it was written in stone, uh, even though I believe it ultimately failed because of, you know, FASA and the licensing and stuff. Right. I actually think that the length of the game would have probably been just a few years longer anyways, just because of uh, the game engine itself. Because I don't think, like we saw it in just the tournament sizes because like there were less and less people coming to our tournaments. And, and now part of that up here in Watsi land, like I said, was that you'd come here and, and we'd have five of the top 10 players in the world coming to our tournaments, like facing that murderer's row in your local tournament scene is horrible because you'd come here and lose every round. Mm -hmm. So as a new player, you'd come here and you'd never win a game. Like it takes a very special player. We had one of those, by the way, Jack, Shout out to you if you're out there. Mm -hmm. Like he literally came and took his medicine every week, lost every single game and kept coming back. Yeah. Um, like there are very few people that'll do that though. Like there, there's not too many people that'll keep doing that. And, and Terry, you had mentioned kind of just the, the, the lack of, of variety that was kind of introduced in each set. You know, do you guys kind of have perspective or, or kind of ideas? Because I know in the community now, you know, it's a dead game. People aren't tied to kind of what the original design is. They can make their own home rules. I know some of the guys have made full comprehensive sets to kind of, you know, uh, streamline the game a little bit better um, and kind of play on their own and have shared that with the community. Are there, you know, I, I know it's a big ass kind of looking, you know, 20 years back, but, you know, are there ideas that you guys can kind of, you know, give to those other players to kind of keep it? engaging and interesting uh, for them at home or, or even kind of thoughts that you have in, in terms of um, how the game continued of, of ideas for uh, the design decision to keep it to where it was had longevity and that it wouldn't it kind of have suffered from its own success. Uh, sure. I, I've, I mean, I've got lots of ideas. Uh, mm -hmm. One idea is you have to rotate out sets, which is pretty much what everyone does now. Mm -hmm. okay. So that way you can't sort of keep with the same cards in the same deck and you don't have to have quite as much card uh, power escalation like you have. I mean, mm -hmm. that's... Um, 
that's one idea. The second thing is that we did talk about this in the first uh, taping is, you know, Big Macs really weren't very good. And, you know, you have to give them a bit of a benefit that as you pay more, you presumably should get something more. And you can have mechanics similar to like a battle cry mechanic in Hearthstone where it does something when it comes into play, like maybe the um, restores five cards from your discard pile back to your stockpile. So you get some tempo back as you play these larger cards and it gives you time to live longer because normally you just don't live long enough to play a deck. Like you finally spent 12 on this card, you bring out a slow mech, it's just useless. And then the only thing you could do with that slow mech is then guard your stockpile. Like the, the mechs, the those mechs were just so incredibly bad and really, really, really overpriced. I went mm. back and looked at some of those cards. So you fix that. Zvi Moskowitz did a pretty cool deck, the all resource deck that kind of um, fireballed you at the end. I thought that deck was was pretty cool um, and had some definitely some good potential. So you know, exploring some of those spell based things were kind of um, you know. Uh, would be kind of neat and the other part that i liked is um you know sealed deck and drafts i think is always a cool way to have replayability and it lets you play a bunch of cards that you wouldn't otherwise play right i find that that's really um really fun to play different mechs or other things like that or have um, tournaments with restrictions like i think bobby fisher in chess once said you know chess is kind of like a bad game now because you just go through these opening trees of how you play your first, you know, 10, 12, 15 moves, whatever, right? You're not really playing chess until you get past where other players have gone before. So maybe you randomly arrange the back row of your pieces, something like that. So you can find ways to introduce different rules into it. Like, you know, you must have 10 cards that cost 10 or more, or, you know, you've you've got a random card that summons from your deck or, you know, there's all kinds of crazy things that could happen or could increase luck. Those are all some, that's another idea. Like Command Circuit is a card from, that I actually played in the World Championship. We hated it because it was a die roll. On one and two, you just bury the card and you lose it. And that's really tough. Three, four, five, you get basically back that draw and the deploy. And six, you get three cards and three deploys. So if you can cause it to live a couple turns, it's really powerful. Your expected value is quite good. But um, it introduces so much variation into that game. (laughs) And maybe Battletech needed more of that. Yeah. Not less. And you had mentioned draft, and and I had gotten in. I played uh, Star Wars Destiny last year, uh, but I was kind of you know between jobs, so I wasn't going to be dropping you know tons of money on buying boxes, and ended up just playing draft exclusively and had a blast with it. You know, but you know, I think that's definitely, you know, even you know, uh, Peter, you were talking about kind of your your uh, your kind of diehard um, you know kind of newbie coming in, uh, but I, I feel like that that draft because you know also kind of adds an element at least you know so that. I think the experienced players are also going to certainly have a, a huge benefit and draft, but they're at least not, uh, those new players aren't playing against kind of that, that vast amount of resource and card availability, but, and it's been, and it keeps. It Dave, levels the benefit field a little bit. Yeah. And at least you, you get rid of that kind of net decking aspect too, you know, is you get back to that kind of core where people yeah. have to, to kind of use their creativity and then bring that kind of deck building back into it, you know, when they're doing drafts. So, you know, that's definitely kind of a, a fun approach there. And I feel like, you know, and as I've been kind of, you know, just kind of, you know, building these cards on my own and kind of brainstorming, like what would happen if like the game was rebuilt, it, it seems... Battletech is so custom suited to, uh, you know, what you've mentioned, Terry, in terms of uh, rotating out cards, because you have your errors, you have your 3025 error, you got your clan evasion error, and then you got the later, your jihad, your civil war, and now they're all the way up to 100 years later. Um, with the the Ilkhan era about to launch, and so that that just seems such a natural thing, you know, if the game was was yeah. there and evolving, and say, all right, well, you know, this round we're you know we're at this time time era, and we're you know stuck in some max there, so you don't have to worry about that that power creep. Um, well, I did want to kind of uh, hop in and do a little question and and answer with this on and off. I definitely have a ton of question myself, but um, you know the the one um, the one guest that we were able to get to kind of hop on uh, to ask this question in person is actually kind of uh, sign on and waiting. So I want to kind of go ahead and kind of pull him in. And so this okay. is. Uh, this is Michael Cohen, who's one of the admins for the uh, Battletech uh, CCG Facebook group and, and who has done an amazing amount to kind of revitalize and keep the community going. And so uh, let me go ahead and bring Michael in. And I know he had a question that I was going to toss out to you guys. This is my first time kind of doing a Q&A, so hopefully, uh, hopefully things happen <laughs> all right. Michael, do you got it? you hear us? Hey, hey. 
Oh, welcome. Nice to meet it, you guys. It works. Um, so, so yeah, so everybody, uh, Michael Cohen here and, uh, and Michael, I gave you a little introduction before you kind of, you signed on. So kind of <laughs> people, people know the contribution that you made to the community, um, and, uh, and kind of make sure they're going to that Battletech CCG, uh, Facebook page, kind of engage if they're interested, but, but, uh, Very let me, cool. let me kind of toss that baton over to you and you can kind of uh, pick the brains of these guys, uh, with some of your, you're a vastly more experienced player than I am. Sure. <laughs> uh, awesome. Um, so I guess uh, I, it's, it's nice to meet you guys. Um, I've obviously read a lot about you and, and a few of the folks from the old tournament scene have been back into the community uh, since the demise of the Yahoo group, notably like Gustav and Mark, which is, they really make really great contributions. There seem to be, well, my first question, the one I posted to, uh, to Travis was, it has to do with sideboarding. Um, obviously nobody's really run a, true competitive construction constructed tournament since the old days. One of the main reasons for that is that, um, well, at least I personally believe, uh, some people disagree, but I believe that the, the meta was left in so, something of a broken state uh, after Crusade. And there are certain things that, that just work too well and never got any official changes. Um, but one of the, as a result of this, one of the lost arts of Battletech CCG has been the art of the sideboard. How do you think about sideboarding? There's a, there's a few pieces that, that bug me about this. The first is that while a magic sideboard is 15 cards, a Battletech sideboard is really only eight cards. And, and that is not a lot. You have to fit a lot in. And when you do put things in there, the, 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 the card count is so low that it feels like the odds of it actually making any difference, unless you dump like four or five cards from your sideboard into your deck, the odds of it making any difference are pretty minimal. So how do you think about sideboarding? How do you design a sideboard and, and how does it actually, how does it work? Terry, you want to start? Sure. I mean, we, I don't think people use their sideboards that much in magic or in other games. If you have to do a lot of sideboarding, your deck is probably not tuned well enough. There's usually a way that kind of generally handles it, but um, the sideboard gives you an opportunity to play four or five cards against someone that can really affect the, you know, in the meta. So we were worried about, in Battletech 98 Worlds, we were worried about um, Tzvi Moskowitz type deck, which is an all-resource deck. And we put in a card like, you know, Financial, or I had it in mind, Financial, financial collapse. collapse, right? Which basically if I understood how this works correctly, still basically kills his deck at some point, right? He puts a bunch of counters on and on my turn, I just build a big mech and destroy that card. So it gives me a, a, a large advantage in the game. So you have to know what cards are, you know, you might be weak against. Uh, we put in unlikely love affair, which basically is an anti-pilot card. Uh, that seemed kind of, um, kind of reasonable that was one of the few ways i thought that my deck could really lose was um, against those really big pilots that someone can get out using a special card so i think you just have to look at those critical weaknesses and know enough about the meta to see which is the deck i really don't want to play and are there any cards that can counter that deck and right. usually i think putting in four or five cards actually does does make a significant difference so you might for example say these are the two uh, archetypes that I am most concerned about. I'm going to put four cards against that archetype, four cards against that archetype. And like, that's it. Just, that's just it. the one or two things. Yeah, that's it. You know, in magic, it was more clear. Like there were a lot of creatureless decks. So if you have kill cards in your deck, you want to swap them out. And that's, uh, that was a good use of the sideboard. But most of the time, I think the sideboards don't make a big difference. It, not in a top, not in a, a best of three match. Peter, did you have a similar experience there? I know uh, in, in your sideboard for the 97, it's, there's, there's two cards. There's six of one and two in the other. Correct, so. yeah, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> we, were, we were ready to fog out anything that tempo-wise we needed to do. So uh, 96, yeah, yeah we, were, we were all about the fogging stuff. Mm. Um, so that's why the sideboard is extremely simple-minded. Uh, we, we got a little more complicated in 98, uh, where we actually did more what Terry did, and we actually went after multiple archetypes. Um, in 97, uh, and, and it really has more to do with the fact that the, the game had evolved, right? So we had, a, we had a better understanding of what decks were out there, whereas in 97, we were more just, this is our deck, and this is what is bad for our deck, and so we need to reset the board, and that's what Heavy, Day, Heavy Fog did. Whether we attacked or defended, we could always reset the board, either by defending our own mechs by fogging it out, so it's a negative fog, or, or by fogging out their attack, either way it worked because it protected our mechs or made their deck mechs useless. 
Um, so that's why I have six of them in 97. Now in 98, uh, like Terry, we actually had uh, a little bit more intricate choices as far as, because the metagame had evolved and we had more understanding of what the metagame looked like. Yeah. And so we actually have some two ofs and some one ofs uh, targeting certain, certain different decks. And we talked, we talked earlier there, guys, about, about kind of that, the competitive scene leading into that first world and kind of how you guys kind of came into kind of building your own decks. Um, and, uh, but you guys, you know, went through that process and came out with two, two very different decks. And, and so I'm kind of curious, and Michael, I'll just keep you on, uh, you know, sure. since I'm sure you're available and you would love to kind of hop in on this. And, and um, Michael's been kind of my mentor in the TCG, you know, because as I've been kind of doing this and building it. But uh, for that first tournament, we talked a little bit of kind of a broader scheme, but we didn't really, you know, kind of get your kind of little storytelling aspect of it, of kind of, you know, uh, what led you to those specific decks and kind of what your experiences was with that with that tournament with that world's tournaments and kind of uh any kind of memories that you might have i know we're drawing a you know asking a lot for 23 year old memory uh to kind of recall any any kind of games or moments in that tournament that kind of may have stood out for you and certainly you know your game against each other if, if you guys have kind of any stories or, or kind of key moments that kind of swung it either way go ahead terry um, I know we played each other in 97 in the finals. Yeah. Peter can tell that story. Yes. Uh, my, my experience was, uh, was uh, I don't remember the game well uh, until he reminded me last week, but I remember <laughs> at the end thinking, man, my deck is really lousy. <laughs> like, I was like, this guy has a much better deck than me. And I said, I'm not going to repeat that mistake um, next year. So what we did is we went out and we really prepared carefully. And, uh, you know, we saw that Peter was the guy to beat and we knew that he liked um, Fenris style fast decks. So we wanted to make a deck that inherently we thought would do well against those decks. And I think we did. Um, and uh, we, we tried all, all the different decks. We had a deck of each time. I had a lot of cards. Like I went out and bought the cards instead of like whatever I had lying around in 97. I traded um, unopened uh, packs of Legends and Magic. I probably did not get a good deal considering what those packs might have been worth now. <laughs> but, you know, I traded a bunch of magic cards away and, and, and bought Battletech cards. And uh, so we had everything we needed. We built all the decks. We played it all. And, and we were really ready against the meta and how to play against the different decks. When do you attack? When do you have to pick off resources? What do you do? Uh, you had a team. You guys are both using the word we a lot, which is really interesting to me. Did you both have like a team behind you, like a small group of, of people who who helped you prep like in a, I don't know, like in a, for a boxing trainer? Uh, so for, for me, I worked with a, a guy named Shui Ao. He was third place in the 97 Worlds and second place in the 98 Worlds. Yep. In 97, we played different decks because we just didn't really have enough cards. And I don't know which, neither of my decks, I think we're all that good. And then in 98, we played a, a nearly identical decks. So Our sideboards were a bit different, but otherwise they were almost card for card the same. And we played a lot of games against each other and really played. I think to succeed at a high level in any game, you cannot do it alone. It wasn't possible back then. And I don't think it's possible now. Yeah, no, it's not. So Peter, you, I think in 98, you both, you, you both, you came first and second with the yes. Sandhurst Royal Military Academy. Day, yes. Which mm -hmm. has generated so many arguments since then. Um, I'd love oh. to get into some, <laughs> I, I have a, I have a whole question about all the arguments that have been generated. Um, All right. I don't know about those arguments. That sounds interesting to hear. Uh, maybe Peter, you can go to answer the question. I have one. I have one story that I told last week. Maybe I'll tell again about the my really memorable moment in the okay. game. <laughs> yes. we'll get back to it. Yes, yes. I'll tell you the story that I told last week, um, which is actually I need to thank Terry and and Sui now for my actual world championship win. Um, and the reason why is is that uh, I was actually going to play Steiner. My actual love love is for Steiner. My house is Steiner. Uh, I'm a Steiner player. I, that's what I played in Battletech, the miniature game. Um, and uh, that's what I was going to play. And there was a, there was a pre-tournament the night before actual worlds in 97. It was six rounds. And um, so of course I was playing my Steiner deck because we didn't know any better to actually hide our decks, um, you know, for the, for the tournament the night, uh, night after. And um, uh, Two rounds into the tournament, my buddy Dave, um, and by the way, speaking of a team, yes, uh, Royal Olympic Guards, my, uh, my uh, home crowd here, that's who I test with. There's uh, five of us that essentially play all types of games. We're gaming nerds, and we get together on Saturdays and Sundays, and um, I mean Fridays and Saturdays, and play games, all types of games. That's actually where I get all my play testing done. Um, but Dave comes to me in round two and goes, Peter, we can't play this deck. 
And I'm like, this is, I'm like hardcore Steiner. I have a, a miscommunications deck that locks you out. By turn four or five, all your decks are locked down. Doc, uh, your, all your mechs are locked down and you can't play the game anymore. I can just keep on recurring miscommunication, locking down all your decks. You don't get to play the game. It's very unfun for you, very fun for me. And then I wreck your, you know, your stockpile. Um, one of the funnest decks I've ever played. One of the most unfun for my opponent. And Dave goes, we can't play it. And I'm like, what do you mean we can't play it? And he's like, I just faced the deck that after round four, I was staring at my cards and I was like, why am I playing this game? I'm, I'm dead. I can't do anything. And I'm like, dude, there is no such deck. What are you talking about? Because remember, there's no meta game. We can't go look on the web. We only have our own local meta game. So we only know our own decks. And he's like, yeah, I just faced a Davian deck that just smoked me. Like I have no idea how, how you can ever beat that deck. And I'm like, well, the wolf would beat it. And he's like, no, I, I'm not even sure Wolf can, but it might stand a better chance. But we can't play Steiner. And I'm like, no, no, you're full of it. We're going to play Steiner for sure. And we keep on playing the tournament. I'm undefeated going into round six. And I'm sitting across from Sui Yikau, um, Terry's friend. He's playing the Davian deck. And sure enough, round four or five rolls around. And I'm staring at the board. And I'm dead. There's literally nothing I can do. He's, he's swarming the board with Davian mix. And I'm like, there's nothing I can do. And that's actually why we audibled to Wolf the Night of Worlds in 97, which was our second deck. So we knew that we could always hunt resources. So Wolf was really my second love, not my first love, Steiner was. But we knew that there was no way that the Steiner deck could beat the Davian Swarm deck after having faced it on Friday night. So we swapped to the Wolf deck uh, to hunt resources on, on Saturday and at the Worlds Tournament. Now, do you have, uh, you know, and kind of recalling your, your game against um, uh, Terry, you know, were there kind of any standout moments or, you know, any kind of cards that really kind of came through with you, came through <laughs> yeah. for you at the end? Well, or? Yeah, yeah, that's definitely true. The, so the card I hate the most in the card game period is, is uh, Superior Navigation because the, I, I can't stand the, any, any cards with die rolls, just like Terry was talking about the, the card that, you know, gives you advantages over things. Superior Navigation is my nemesis because, you know, you, you get that one or a two and you run a mech into something and it just bonks his head. And at the most critical moments when that happens, you just lose games. But yet the card was so explosive and so good that Dave and I could just simply not not play the card. So we had to have it in there um, because when you roll that five or a six and you get to suddenly, you know, go again and sack two resources in one turn, um, Nothing beats it when you have Mr. Spanky on turn two and your superior nav and suddenly your opponent is back in the stone age. And so in, in, the, in the finals against Terry in round one, I managed to uh, get board control fairly early. I uh, controlled his resources and the game ends. In game two, uh, I missed my resource on turn, turn, I think it was three or four, and that gave him just enough time to get his mech, uh, uh, his pilot into his mech and he goes off and there's just nothing I can do. And so we go into game three and in game three, that's when I get the dream scenario where I get the dasher A out and uh, I flip it and I have to <laughs> play the, the infernal superior navigation. And with a shaky hand, I roll the die and I roll a five and I destroy two of his resources. And uh, that set him back to a point where uh, two turns later, um, Terry goes to play a, um, a pilot onto my mech and I'm like, wait, wait, wait. And then he's like, no, no, I'm conceding. Uh, and I'm like, oh, okay. Uh, I was so focused on the game. I didn't even realize that that was his play because he had no other play to make. Gotcha. So. <laughs> well, you got, you got your revenge the, the, the next year, Terry. Yes. So. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah. actually Sue Yip did because he was the one who eliminated. I, I, faced, I placed third the next year. Yeah. It was to his Sandhurst deck, but he was, Sue Yip was who beat me in the semifinals. Definitely. Yeah. Uh, so I have one more story to tell. Uh, so yeah. it goes back to the the first um, Majors Pro Tour I played in, I guess it was probably 96, could have been, yeah, I think it was 96, where I'm in the quarterfinals uh, I'm about, and I'm about to win. And I, I attack with my creatures and then I ask my opponent, do you have any fast effects? He says no. And I go to play a card that will do enough damage and kill him and I win the semifinals. It's game three. And the head judge 
comes in and says, no, 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 you're not allowed to do that. And he makes a ruling, which was very new at, at the time. He says, well, once you say, do you have any fast effects, you pass off your right to play. And if your opponent says no, there's no more time for you to play. And that avoids kind of this like bizarre scenario where you each say, no, you go, no, you go, no, you go. And it's such sort of a clear turn order, but it was relatively new. And I felt to, and I, I, so I'm not allowed to play my card. My opponent draws the next turn and kills me with the card and I lose and I'm eliminated from the tournament. And I felt that was a very unfair ruling because it didn't have to, usually you don't want to have a ruling interfere with the game. It was very clear with my, what my intention was. I had a very clear play and um, he could have let the, let the game proceed naturally and I would have won. I think that would have been the best ruling so that didn't necessarily hurt me because it means I didn't qualify for worlds I had to go and re-qualify and then I ended up winning a pro tour because I had worked so hard and it wasn't necessarily bad for me but I remember that play and that head judge come battle tech um, it's the same head judge now I guess he's been instead of the magic head judge he's now the battle tech head judge and I'm in the quarterfinals and there's a card like Kai champion of Solaris that does two damage to all max in combat with Kai so we're in a big fight and I think Kai lets you like win initiative or something like that. There's, you know, he's got way more initiative than I do. So we, we do a bunch of damage. He uses Kai's ability, does two damage to all mechs. And I say, well, okay, that mech dies. He says, well, why? He says Kai does two damage to him. He says, no, no, Kai only does damage to your opponents. I'm like, no, it's just all, all two damage to all mechs in combat with Kai. My mechs and your mechs, we're all in combat together. Yeah. The head judge comes, makes the ruling, says, yep. Two damage to all mechs. And I think I win the game and the tournament because of that. I was very, very close to losing to that pilot deck. And, uh, and um, later, the creators come back to the head judge and say, uh, you know, that was clearly the wrong rule. Like, Kai doesn't hurt his own friends, right? Like, <laughs> so um, I felt like a bit of a karmic balance to have a, a restoration from what I thought were two bad rulings now from the same judge. <laughs> one that hurt me and one that helped me. So that was... Uh, that was kind of my key moment. Otherwise, I would have been a quarterfinalist in the, uh, you know, maybe fifth in the tournament. Mm-hmm. Well, the, well, they say it's it's the the hardest lessons that are the best. So it sounds like it worked out on the magic side of things as well. Yeah, it was okay. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, it was okay. So, Michael, what is this? What is this controversy? These arguments that are coming. You know, please oh, share. First yeah. of all, I wanna I wanna back up and say you've just uh, given me Terry something to add to the FAQ. Okay. Um, <laughs> I had never noticed the textual change between Kai Champion Merc Warrior version and Kai Champion Commander's Edition version. Um, I maintain a list of all cards that that had significant textual changes, okay. and that wasn't on it. Oh, okay. so, <laughs> oh, there you go. Yeah, 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 I'll, needs, I'll add that. It needs to be on it for a specific reason. <laughs> yeah, because yeah, yeah, the, the, the card reason. itself was clear, I thought. I thought it does two damage to all mechs in combat. You know, I mm-hmm. think that the judge's ruling in that sense was correct. That's what the card yes. said, but it was not what the creators intended. Yeah, it, it, well, it, actually, it actually reads that way. It, it clearly is not. Kai doesn't hurt his own mechs. <laughs> <laughs> well, so it depends like on the mean, definition mean, of engaged in battle with. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. well, no, I, and I mean, that's obviously where even the judge <laughs> Head judge got it wrong, right? I mean, yeah. the, the, right. The, the wording is piss poor. I mean, it clearly should state that it just hurts opponents' yeah. max, right? Let's dive in. I got a couple other questions from the yeah, yeah. community. I, I want to make sure that. Man. <laughs> sure, let's do it. We, uh, it's so been the a pleasure next... to meet you guys. I'll drop awesome. off. Awesome. Right. Thank, Thank you, you. Michael. Great Thank meeting you. you. All right. Bye-bye. Thank you for what you're doing for the community. I'd love to see you post on the Facebook group. Join us. <laughs> <laughs> Connect then. Yeah. All right. So next one up was an, another member uh, of the community and, and one of the patrons of this channel uh, and who was kind of in that my first kind of uh, uh, discussion there with Michael talking about the history game. But uh, Chester Hendricks has been kind of really involved in kind of that evolution that Michael was involved in with the uh, creating a, an expansive card set and kind of almost doubling the cards available to, to those that are playing online. But um, Chester was in, like, really interested in kind of that, uh, that very unique uh, prize that, that you got, Peter, uh, after that first world championship of getting to design your own card. And so, and Chester was really interested in kind of the process that you went through and kind of getting that, that card made and the parameters and the process for the art and how long it took, um, you know, basically kind of just kind of tell us about that kind of that unique prize. And so, so sadly, once again, as we said last week, I, I actually didn't get to design the card mm-hmm. because I would have never designed that crappy a card. <laughs> uh, now that said, it was cool to have the card. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, that was fun. But yeah, no, I, um, yeah, Mech Warrior Peter, as awesome as, as the artwork is and as awesome as the card is, I had no say in any of it. Hmm. 
And uh, so, and that kind of- I, I, would, I would have made a Dasher style attack mech, not a mech warrior, because I, I was never into playing mech warriors. That was Terry's thing. That's actually what Terry should have had as a card. Yeah, <laughs> I, I didn't get my card. It was promised. Yeah. It was one of the prizes, but it didn't happen. If someone is reprinting or creating a new set and they want yeah, to create should, a, yeah, a they card, should make a Terry card. Yeah, come talk to me. I'll help you make a card, and we'll uh, we'll do something cool. I'll play test it. And, and, and awesome. it should be a and that should be a pilot. Awesome. Yeah. Well, Terry, I got. Yeah. Uh, I was I was telling you, I got that the uh, the template for the cards, which looks spot on. It looks beautiful. Um, so let's collaborate and you can, you can tell me that card and I'll print it up and I'll share it with that group and anyone can play it. That would be awesome. Awesome. And, and Peter, you can do that too. Like, so let's say what's that, what's the card that you would have designed and let's make the true could have been, should have been Peter and Terry world champion cards. And I'll make those customs <laughs> and share them with the group. So that, yeah. okay. that would be awesome. And maybe we could think of a card that would change some of the meta, like rather than something that would fit with my deck, maybe I'll think about something that would make large mechs more playable. That would be a, you're, a way to build infrastructure, bootstrap it. You're, you're, you're speaking sweet nothings to me. Uh, to, yeah. <laughs> because for me, one of my big things and the things I've been doing with my own, with the own cards I've been customizing, completely revamping the costing and, uh, and definitely uh, we, um, you know, I want to get I want to get Peter, you know, to give some insights into what his card would be. But then I want to I, I just want to destroy resources, man. Okay, okay. So that's what we'll do uh, best. We'll figure out a good card that's not broken, but it's good, <laughs> and that Peter knows that if he we're still playing, he put it in every one of his decks. And uh, definitely. And oh, listen, it. I tried. I tried so hard to put Macquarie Peter. He's fucked so bad. And uh, it, yeah, my, my play group was laughing at me every time they had him. <laughs> I put him in my deck. They're like, again, Peter, again, really? Yeah, um, no. Mechward Peter, like, Peter is like the kind of the uh, the guy who's inherited his family's mech and, and really has no business being in a mech. In the first <laughs> oh, place, yeah, that card but... is terrible. I just looked it up. It is awful. Yeah, it I is, could see. It is, it's miserable. It's like, how often is your fast? Yeah, yeah. No, it's just awful. Awesome. It, caught, it caught my mullet, though. That was pretty cool. Awesome. Yeah, there we go. It's too bad that if if it if it could work on any mech, at least you could have like a big mech. Yeah, yeah. Damage that then, might then, then, it might, then it might be worth. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's just like. No, it's just yeah. useless. Yeah. Well, Peter, Peter, your mullet is in true homage to original. Yeah. Original. <laughs> it's Battle a nice tech. picture, but you know, yeah. it's like you pick up those original BattleTech source books, and and it is mullet central. So, uh, so that's <laughs> like a, a good. Yeah. It, it would fit perfectly into the BattleTech universe. Yes, yeah, you can't quite see it. I I just donated eighteen inches, so okay. I, I do eighteen. It about every, oh my yeah, goodness! I, it's, that's why it's only <laughs> shoulder length right now. I uh, oh boy. about every two years I donate eighteen inches. Oh my goodness. Um, uh, so let's let's get into kind of my my fan question, which is uh, you know the the costing. How would how would you fi say if I can throw out I can make all my my custom cards? How would you fix the costing on the big mix? Is it just a matter of kind of bringing the cost down and then piggybacking onto that? As a new player, I still don't understand in terms of the card construction of like the considerations for adding the resource buyouts. Um, even to the point where I'm like, well, maybe if I if I have this and I put the base cost a little low, but I put like an undesirable buyout, like a logistics or something that'll kind of possibly raise the cost. But anyway, I want to kind of throw it to you guys. You know, if you were if you were just going to recost those big max, you know, what what would the adjustment be? What would the thresholds be for bringing them down so that they're they're playable, viable, but not broken? Who do you want? Pick Terry, a person. Terry, let's go. Let's uh, start with I mean, Terry. look, so the way I like to look at the world is see what did other games do to make that work, right? Mm -hmm. Like, how did Magic let you fight with big dragons or Hearthstone let you cast 10 cost creatures? And, you know, Hearthstone has a taunt idea, right? Is where you go and you have to attack that mech first, right? Oh, That's yeah. a way that you can, you know, stall out the game that way you have to be very careful with that ability mm -hmm. i think you just make them cost less like when you look at what like a you know a 13 cost mech or something like that like they're awful like you know if i look at a mad here's like an example a mad cat c i have up on screen <laughs> it costs 11 it's a two armor nine hit point it does five damage it's got one missile uh it has overheat two plus two attack like that mech's just not really that good and for 11 like you spend all that mana what do you get from that you know yeah. it's very little so that thing should cost like seven right the other thing you can do is that you can play cards that reduce the cost of your more expensive mechs by one right or your next mech cost less right so it's kind mm -hmm. of a construction maybe it's a resource card that lets you put two or three um resource counters on a large mech kind of like urza's mines and magic 
is another way of um, doing that. The battle cry mechanic where you can restore some cards to buy you some time to build a deck or having a large mech automatically start guarding your stockpile, something like that, right? Okay. Yeah. Build it or, you know, or a mech that is upgradable. So you spend five mana on it and anytime you want to, you flip it over or something or you flip it the other way and now it's a bigger mech and you spend six more resources mm -hmm. on it. Right. So you have like the mini version and then the expanded armed version or something like that. So it lets you upgrade it, you know, and that way you could try to get to the point where you're playing a bit of a longer game and, you know, the time when you have tons of mana on turn nine or 10, you can actually do something. Gotcha. Peter, any, what was that? What would be your approach similar or slightly? Oh, different? Yeah, I, I think, I think Terry, I think Terry hit the nail on the head. I mean, the fact mm -hmm. is, is that there's already been successful ways of doing it in other games. Yeah. And, and I mean, like a recovery mechanic or, or an acceleration mechanic, I think one, one or the other is probably what you need to do. Gotcha. Um, the problem with the recovery mechanic is, is that uh, if you get it too late, you're just dead. So right. I actually think that it probably has to be an acceleration mechanic because the, you know, mechs are too overcosted as they are currently. So yeah. unless you're actually going to go into the game already and then, f you know, f fix their costs, mm -hmm. um, I, I, I'm pretty sure that you have to accelerate somehow. Um, and, and one thing I'd noticed too, and just in terms of some of the values on, the, on those big mechs, you know, they were just kind of ramping up values. I mean, there were big mechs with 11 attacks and stuff like that. And if you go to the, the tabletop, um, you know, even that big mech that they, they had had cost 11 attack and you compare it to another heavy mech that might be a three, a three or four attack, that mech and tabletop doesn't, doesn't bring two to three, more than two, almost three times the attack value. And so when I was kind of building my own, like I found that the it really maxed out if I was kind of, you know, looking at the, the weapons and how much damage they contribute uh, without overheating, uh, that it really maxed out around six. And the most I found was seven and the, the weapons on that particular mech were all short range. And so I put a little uh, custom text in there saying that it couldn't target any mech that was faster than it um, in order to justify that. But, uh, but yeah, it maxed out at six. And then and then, you know, the extra attack from the extra weapons came through overheat and alpha strike. And that was also a way that I felt, and it, and it helped me bring, justify bringing the cost down into a range that was appropriate. But, uh, but yeah, I was, uh, you know, maybe I'll, I'll toss, I'll toss some cards out to you guys so you can look and, and, you know, you can use your expertise to see if, if it's crazy or not. I can't yeah. remember. Is the, is the Daishi A in game? Is uh, it is in game and it is not playable. So the closest one to playable was the Daishi B. And actually, the 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 Daishi Prime is is one of the ones that I cuz Let's throw it up. Let's have a little fun. We'll do a little screen share. The Daishi, Daishi A is in in the miniature game is probably the heat, heat tightest, and and the uh, the clan mech that puts out the most power. Yeah. It's running so, the pulse, pulse lasers that hit uh, that have uh, um, they have uh, positives to hit and the uh, clan pulse lasers uh, technology is essentially heat tight yeah so it's the uh, so in the uh so in the card game that's a 17 cost mech with a 12, yeah. what the i just 12, pulled it up on screen yeah. attack yeah and i'll i'll throw it up here for people to look <laughs> like, at i don't know how you get 17 so uh, resource 17, into it like no, no, no. what do you do cost? yeah, yeah. That's, that's nuts it's let nuts, me uh yeah. let me try i think the 12 attack yeah the highest is prometheus i think that has a 20 cost yeah it has a 20 cost it's insane Wow. Here, let me do it. We'll do it. This will be, this will be well, my. Yeah. No, Prometheus, yeah, Prometheus is a named Daishi, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah it's the only one. Sure. It's unique. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was going to say. I no, there's, the, there's, a, there's a, uh, there's a Widowmaker. Oh, yeah. I see the Widowmaker well. here. That's, That's uh, yeah, a 411 is, does 12. Which is Natasha Karensky's one, right? Right, right. That's yeah. Natasha Karensky's mech. It's unique, yeah. 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 And, and Gustav, you know, and Mark had, had a deck where they basically used OmniNet, OmniNet pods uh, cash to get out. They had a combo. Uh, to to pop out the the cheapest daishi early, I think like turn three or something, and then they use the Omnimet podcast to swap it with the Widowmaker, and then they could start attacking with the Widowmaker. So that was the only known way to kind of actually put those cards in play. What card was that? I'm gonna look up which card you're talking about. Uh, so he had Omnimet uh, podcast, which basically allows you to to pay for any version of a mech and then swap it for yeah. another version. Okay. Uh, by I, I think just starting yeah. cards. Yeah, so it cheats it into play. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. Um, and that was the, the only way. And so he had any, so he had six days. She's the cheapest one. And then he kind of swapped it in for the, for the hardest hitting one. Um, but yeah, let me do a, a, this. So I'll take advantage of having you guys and I'll do my own little geek out. So let me do a screen share of the one that I made and you guys 
can give me your input. There's a, Oh, I see that. Oh, that's a dasher. Never mind, not dashy. <laughs> okay. Yeah, now there is. A, yeah, big difference between those two. <laughs> yeah, I know. I can see that now. <laughs> one, one, is, one is a small, fast mech, and the other one is a heavy 100 ton mech. Yeah, yeah. yeah. All right. So, do you guys see this one now? Yeah, the direwolf. So, brown. there's two. Oh, there's yeah. there's two numbers that are wrong, right? So, on the I can't figure out how to do double digits, but I had it costed at 11. And the uh, structure is 11, but I haven't figured out how to do uh, a double digit on either of those bubbles yet. But otherwise, it's where I came up with. So, so yeah, it's like it maxes out at six. I mean, obviously, there's lots of other damage if you're doing other things. But, uh, but if that was 11 cost with 11 structure, what do you guys think? You know, give me your opinion on. So overheats for free. Yeah, overheats for free. If it's not, if it's not taking damage from other places. Well, no, no, yeah, that, obviously, yeah. Um, yeah, you need war funds. Don't don't uh, nerf war funds if you're gonna play. Yeah, it. no, yeah, this, this <laughs> not playable without war funds. Yeah, yeah. You're and not that gonna was, see the resources to get this up. Well, and that was that was my main my main question is that all right? So it's definitely eleven structure, and I basically everything in the stat box is is pulling from in game stats, and so it's comparing it to other games. It's it's what I consider the most appropriate for what the weapon loadout. But that the my my question is. You know, ignoring all of those, the, that base cost and buyouts, what would you guys set the base cost and buyout to make this mech viable without broken? What does long range four do again? Um, long range is, uh, is damage that you can assign to the target oh, right. okay, if yeah. you're blocked. And usually in the game, it's maxed out at two, but I ignore that rule in mine. And I just considered any damage that came from a weapon with a range greater than 21 could contribute long range and with the four large lasers. Yes, yeah, so so your question. You bleed through four no matter what. Yeah. Right. So the question, if you had four armor and 11 structure instead of eight and still Correct. did six damage, what would be a good cost for that mech? Yes, that's my question. So four, 11, six? Four, yeah, 11, four, six. 11, six. Yep. That's pretty powerful. Um, yeah, it is. This is a missile. It has a good overheat. Yep. Yeah, it's got a free overheat, essentially. But once again, obviously, if you take damage, you take damage. Yeah, but, no, you, I mean, but when you attack, over, you can do overhead. 10. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's what I'm yeah. saying. It's free overheat. <laughs> I, you know, it's been a while since I played the game. I think if you could set that at around 10, you might be playable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was going to say, I, I, I saw an 11 in my mind when I saw this thing. 11 with no buyouts or with what buyouts would you guys use on that? I would scale back the buyouts to lower than the threes, probably twos yeah. maybe. Yeah, and again, that's, those are just fillers. That I just happen to uh, plug that in. That's what I, I happens to be twos, on this template. I would do twos and drop the L. Twos and drop the L, okay. Yeah, do APM, APM twos, and 11 cost. Okay. Yeah, I think that's that. I mean, that seems that seems reasonable. It's probably still too high, sadly enough. But I mean, yeah, I mean, the other thing you do is you could create the formula and make a change so that every point gets you more, gets you an increasing amount. Yep. Right. Right. So every every extra cost you spend, instead of getting you like three quarters of an arm or whatever, you increase that by fifty percent, mm -hmm. and see where you end up with in terms of costing, if that's reasonable. Yeah. yeah, for sure. Uh, and what, Peter, what makes you choose uh, P over L? Like, what are your considerations there? Uh, specifically, since you wanted it to be playable, it's actually what, what I, because L is just not that playable in game in my mind. Gotcha, gotcha. And so then, uh, so you were saying 11 with AMP? Yep, AMP too. All right. I would, I would drop some of that, you know, maybe just put um, A and M. Sure. You know, that way, otherwise, yeah, I could go with that. it's too yeah, hard yeah. to build a deck around it. Like, sure. You know, you don't want to be frustrated that where right. you can't cast that thing. Yep. And is it is it viable to kind of uh, to maybe um, artificially lower the base cost by adding those undesirable buyouts? So if if you were going to say eleven with AM, and just maybe say like um, you know a one L or one P and make it nine instead, you know, and then most people aren't going to want to have L or P, but if they are doing L or P, they could. Is that a viable way to do things? I don't think adding the uh, the uh, resource cost is worth it. Yeah. Because I think it makes it less playable. Interesting. Okay. I, I don't think it's just less fun. Happened. I think it's less fun. Well, I that, always hated. I always hated like those costs and and those things. Like I thought, you know, I, I get why. You know, you, you know, this is really a very similar system to Magic in many ways, yeah. right? There's a multicolor yeah. mechs, right? Designed by the same guy. Yeah, it's, it's a four color mech. Yeah, I'd rather I'd rather minimize that. Yep. So like 11, 11 with a 3A, 3M? Yeah. Cool. Or two. Or two. Or two, like Terry said, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Well, thanks for humoring me, guys. That was, that, oh. that was uh, you know, fun. That was oh, like course. my little, little fan thing. Um, let's see. I'll grab my questions back. 
So we have a couple more uh, from the community. Um, oh, they were asking kind of, um, you know, what has been your exposure into the game, you know, since kind of dropping off? Have you guys kind of played it all, um, you know, since then? Any kind of, you know, pickup games or tournaments or casual? I played exactly once since the 98 Worlds, okay. and that was at Gen Con <laughs> maybe a decade ago. Someone had a box, um, which I have lots of bat uh, Battletech cards and sealed, you know, uncut sheets. I got all kinds of crazy swag if people oh. want something or they're, they're interested. I don't know what to do with it. Sitting in my yeah. parents' house for 20 years, but I've got it. Um, yeah, I played about 10 years ago at Gen Con. There was like a two-round tournament or something. It was fun. Yeah, we had a good, awesome. yeah, had a good time. Yeah, maybe yeah. I can uh, connect with you. Uh, you know, I've... Uh, you know, when I get a little funds, I can send maybe pick up a box of Arsenal or something from you because uh, yeah, I could take a look what I have. Awesome. What I really want to find a home for is my uncut cards. Yeah, I don't know Ooh. what to do with them. I, like, I there's a, on the battle on the Facebook page, Battletech CCG trade and sell page. Um, you know, so you could obviously go eBay, go that route. But if you want to kind of hit those fans at Battletech trade and sell, uh, there's a trade and sell general for Battletech, and there's one for the CCG. And I'm, I'm sure the community would love uh, to kind of have that post. I, I, I want them to be used. Like, I actually don't really care. But like, I, I'm fortunate in my life to not be that cost sensitive, right? Yeah, I've had a, yeah. like a long, solid career. But, awesome. you know, I want people to be using that stuff, right? Like, if, you, yeah. if it goes up on your wall, I'm happy. I feel like it's done something with it. If you cool. throw it away, we're forget it. <laughs> well, I'm sure we could find a home. There's a lot of Yeah, that's, that, that would be interesting. Cause I'm wondering what to do with them. And I don't oh, yeah. see... I don't see a way to use it in my house. Awesome. Well, we'll, we'll connect. We'll find a good home. <laughs> okay, we can connect after. Yeah. Find, find it a good home for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Peter, any, any, any uh, cool swag that you, got, you guys got other than that card sheet that Terry mentioned? Uh, I mean, I, I, have the, uh, I have the Zeus painting, I guess. That's the one thing that I got from uh, the first Worlds. Yeah. yeah. So that was kind of cool. So I got that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I wanted that painting because I actually played the Zeus. <laughs> I had a lot to play for, but then I was like, oh, I also have some of the original yeah. art, but not, yeah. the, not the one I, yeah, I really yeah, I wanted. The, yeah, I got the Zeus in, Zeus in Terry's yeah. deck, yeah. Well, yeah, Peter, Peter was trying to play the Zeus, but he, he kind of his, uh, oh, his, uh, his intelligence agents, you know, told him uh, to yeah. not do that. Yeah, intelligence agents <laughs> told yeah. me, no, no, no Zeus. <laughs> no Zeus. Go awesome. with the clan. Yeah. Um, Peter, how about you? Have, you? have you played since kind of the, the glory days? You know, I, I only played one game as well, and, and that was uh, at um, DeciphraCon in 2002, I guess Ghostop, actually, and, and he reminded me exactly why I quit the game. Oh, no. Uh, yeah, yeah, he brought out the, the busted version of the Sanders deck and goes, hey, oh, you might play, you play, may, might play in your 97 uh, World Championship deck against this one? Yeah. And I'm like being the, you know, accommodating world champion. I'm like, sure, I'll play it. And mm -hmm. of course, he you know he locked me up in three turns and just beat the snot out of me and i'm like hey yeah that's, that's the deck why. that made that's the deck that made me quit the game <laughs> oh, no. uh well that's power creep for you right you know it's yeah. if you just uh if you took a magic deck from 1997 then you're probably not oh. gonna, gonna hold up very well <laughs> yeah no it's not gonna hold up too well <laughs> yeah. it is not <laughs> yeah yeah no it was, it was all in good fun yeah yeah no, and that sadly, sadly does highlight, however, how badly they uh, treated the, the creep at the end. Yeah, it, yeah it, okay. those, those free deploy things are no good. Well, if you guys ever get the itch, you know, they've done a good job setting it up on, on Lackey and Tabletop Simulator. So you might, you know, kind of hop in or, you know, come in as a guest. I'll, guest I'll check out the uh, Facebook page. Awesome. So you can, play, you can play live or play online. Yeah, they have, there's two ways. The lackey is the way that most people kind of steer people. It's, it's a very rudimentary look to it, but it's the most functional and then people, you can also play on Tabletop Simulator, which looks a lot better, but it's a, a lot more clunky to, to build the decks particularly. Um, but yeah, there's if you go into the announcements section for you and for everyone listening of the Facebook, uh, the Battletech CCG Facebook page, um, and you can just hop in and, and ask a question there. I'm sure you know the guys would love to kind of guide you through. Uh, Michael's a great job kind of you know, talking through, but even I and my rudimentary skill was able to install Lackey um, you know, as a non-computer guy in general. Um, cool. but, uh, but yeah, and, uh, you know, if you guys get both get on, you know, let me know and, and maybe we can set up kind of like a, uh, you know, a celebrity, uh, homage <laughs> tournament, you know, and I can record that and we can put it on the, uh, put it on the channel and people would, people would love that. I'm sure. Um, 
kind of looking back, uh, do you guys remember any kind of decks uh, from other players that, that really kind of stood out as kind of really creative, really innovative that you re really enjoyed or really feared kind of, uh, you know, playing back in the day? Yeah, I mean, definitely Svimozovic's um, uh, mech list deck was, was the one that stands out to me. I mean, that was... Um, and that was with, what, strategic bombardment and then just a ton of yeah. resources? Okay. Yeah, correct. He, he built up, uh, it, it was it was mechless. He built up this massive bombardment and just nuked you out of the sky. I played him in the quarterfinals in in, uh, in um, 98. And uh, yeah, I, I beat him in game one. I managed to get the bombardment under control. In game two, the bombardment slipped out from my, he made me attack his resources and the bombardment went out of control and he nuked me. And in game three, um, uh, there was one turn where I managed to get the bombardment down just enough to buy myself enough uh, time to build up a resource sacking team. Uh, but then he managed to draw into uh, his diversion, uh, the, like the diversion cards. I can't remember what they're called now. But he managed to start diverting me. And I'm like, oh, no, this is slipping out of control. And he got to a point where literally the bombardment was big enough to finish me off if he could draw it. And so, but I have a, I have a sacking team that's big enough to just kill all of his resources in one go yeah. so we're literally down to like he's gonna draw his two cards mm. and i either kill him and sack his well I sack his resources and the game ends or he draws the uh, you know the the bomb off the top of the deck to, to i mean the, the resource to finish off because he needed a resource to tap to finish me off and we're both like okay flip him and he flips the two cards and lucky for me it's not the resource he needed mm. uh, so uh, that's how i managed to finish him off yeah. But man, that was a memorable. That was a memorable game because it came down to literally those two cards flipped off the top of the deck. Awesome. And that was what put me up against uh, Suya Kao in the in the semis that I then ultimately ended up losing in Sandra, Sandra's deck. And yeah. that was once again another game that went to to, to three resource. I mean, to three games that came down to uh, you know one last attack where I, I could not. I needed a resource and I didn't draw it. Awesome. Terry, any any decks that really stood out to you or, or were memorable that weren't. Uh... You know that were your own back in the day. Peter described. I thought that was a cool deck, and he did. Yeah. Uh, he did a good job on it. Awesome. Now, um, for for you guys, and I know Terry, you dropped off. You know, almost immediately after after went in that in nineteen ninety eight. But Peter, you, you stuck on for a little bit. Where for either of you, were there were there decks that you really enjoyed playing, or that you played a lot, other than kind of the ones that you were known for? You know, that uh, that just kind of maybe didn't make it into those tournament lists that have survived through the years that that we can all see. Other than that Steiner deck, you know, um, <laughs> you know Peter, for the other games that you like to, other decks that you really like to play in casual games, um, you know, when you weren't I, playing the boom. I, I mean, I, I played that miscommunication deck so much. I love to, uh, like, it was literally a lockdown deck. Yeah. I, I don't know if you remember miscommunications, but it puts three counters on a mech. Yeah. And they come off one by one. Yep. And your yep, mech yep. doesn't untap, right? And, and so I, I'd recurse the card. Mm -hmm. And so I'd literally lock down your whole entire board. Yeah, and I remember I remember when I was trying to connect with you, and it was it was good stuff. It eventually connected us, Peter. Uh, but I had found a couple links uh, for you uh, uh, playing Magic, and you were playing a Blue Control. So I, I just yeah. I feel like that's kind of in your in your blood there. <laughs> it is. That's, that's where it came from. That was literally the first deck that I was gravitating to. Was I saw miscommunication, and I'm like, man, if I can recurse this somehow, I can I can lock down their board. Definitely. And so I found a way to do that. And that, that was, that was, that was my other deck. I mean, obviously resource controlling does the same, essentially the same day thing. You just control the, their resources instead of their mech. So gotcha. either way you lock them down and they don't get to have fun. Yeah. Terry, were there other decks that you kind of, you, you enjoyed playing with uh, Su Yik, you know, that, that led to kind of what you guys ultimately settled on? You know, I always wanted to play deck us with big mechs, which could not make it work. Uh, I could not find any way to to play those cards mm. successfully. Like, you know, there are styles in Magic where you control early and then you bring out a Sarah Angel and just keep attacking with this 4-4 mm. flyer that doesn't attack. That's your whole strategy. It's a very old school style. And I thought we could do that with um, big mechs where, you know, you bring out a big mech and you just keep chump blocking with these little mechs and a kill one mech per turn kind of thing. And then finally I hit your stockpile for 50 and, you know, that kind of, that kind of attack. I, we could not make that work. <laughs> um, the other thing I did like, though, is playing with a bunch of random cards where you you know, like some sort of draft or sealed deck. I thought that was always really fun, especially when you're pretty tight on cards because it makes you play a different set of cards other than the most optimal ones. And I always thought that was way more enjoyable and different rather than a deck that basically plays kind of the same way. And, you know, when I was playing my world champion deck, I could play that on an automatic pilot, really. Awesome. You know, and that wasn't 
you know, I'd already played it. <laughs> it wasn't as yeah. much fun. And I know some of the guys with that online community, they've kind of, they're, they're trying to work up, uh, you know, this cube system for, for drafting so that they can essentially kind of draft online. So maybe, you know, kind of the more people talk about it and kind of lens for that, maybe it'll, it'll get enough interest that people can kind of complete that, that idea and kind of make it happen. Because so. it, it gets around all of the card problems that you're describing, right? Depending on how you do it. It still doesn't yeah. make, Big Macs are much more playable in a draft. Gotcha. Right. When you're when you don't have all those optimized other cards, and you know the four, five, six, seven cost max, I found were a sweet spot in draft yeah. kind of thing, if I recall. So, you know, it may be a, a reasonable compromise. Yeah. Awesome. Well, that that takes care of my questions. We we've had this has been a fun conversation, guys. Even though you know a lot of it was second, you know, I thought I thought uh, you know <laughs> it was uh, it was just as fun having it the second time. I really appreciate yeah. you guys taking taking twice the time uh, to sit down because <laughs> I know the community would love it, and I know we talked about this last time. But uh, you know, if there were anybody watching and they have some questions of their own, you know, maybe that that we didn't cover here, if they can kind of throw them down in the comments down below and uh, I can kind of show you guys the link to the video. Of course, once it gets posted, maybe we can, uh, you can pop in uh, to the video, you know, a couple times over the, that first month. And, uh, and if you see any questions that people want to kind of present to you guys, maybe kind of, kind of do a little, uh, do your, your own little Q or a, that would be, that would be really awesome. I'm sure that the, sure. the, the, the fans. Yeah, but, uh, yeah. yeah, sure. No problem. Yeah. yeah and and kind of, and, and final shout outs, uh, you know, for Renegade HPG, you know, uh, make sure you're subscribing to the, the channel and more importantly, kind of sharing it and getting out to the community. I think just kind of the more people kind of, you know, are, are seeing that there are still ways to kind of uh, engage with the, the TCG um, that they can play online. Um, and, uh, and there's also ways if you talk to the, to that Facebook group that you can uh, uh, get your card set without spending lots and lots of money on eBay. So, uh, so, you know, there's my little kind of wing and hint, go to that uh, Facebook page. Um, and definitely, you know, for everyone out there, you know, if you can support this channel, help, help me kind of, uh, you know, cover the cost and, and put more content out there, uh, check out Renegade HPG on Patreon. And, uh, and with that, uh, I'll give my, my uh, final heartfelt thanks to, to you guys for having this conversation. It's been a ton of fun. And, uh, and yeah, I'll, I'll circle back with you, you know, Terry, and we'll find a way to get some of those, those cool memorabilia out to the community to people yeah, who, sure. will, who will love it and cherish it. And, yes. uh, and I definitely, <laughs> if we can get that kind of, uh, that kind of, um, you know, retrospective, uh, a, a rematch, a digital rematch of you guys, maybe on a lackey or one of those other, uh, that would be, <laughs> that'd be awesome. That can be a future episode, but, um, but that's okay. it. So this is uh, Travis signing off for Renegade. That was good. Thanks gentlemen. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.